So, Anthony, you've been um, in White House, you've been with Trump, um, you've been with SBH. Um, right, we'll get, you, we're going early with the failures, though. Okay, good. Right, we'll, let's get right in. But with the failure, that's when you become stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I mean, there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of pain when you're going through a failure. So I'll set the scene for you. If you ever think you're having a bad day and it's not health related, I mean, God forbid a doctor tells you some bad news about your health, but I'll, I'll set the scene for you. Everything you have in a bad day, let me take you through my day on the 31st of July, 2017. At 9.30 in the morning, the first official act for the new chief of staff, John Kelly, was to fire me. At two o'clock, it went out on the air that I got fired. And then, you know, I was getting lit. I got lit up by every cable pundit. I then got destroyed by the late night comedians, but they started 10 days ago. I mean, I only lasted 11 days or you could say 954,000 seconds. Sometimes I say that to my therapist, it sounds longer, but I'm getting killed on social media, I'm getting killed on cable news punditry, I'm getting lit up by the comedians at night, and then I'm getting parodied on Saturday Night Live. And my wife, who thank God, we patched things up, uh, filed for divorce. So if you think you're having a bad day, call me, I'll give you my cell phone number, and I'll take you through that day, and you know, hopefully it'll make you feel better, because what is the point of bringing all that up, you know, some of it I brought on myself, some of it were mistakes I made, some of it were misjudgments, uh, but my wife really did not want me to go work for Mr. Trump or President Trump. You know, she hates Donald Trump almost as much as Melania hates him, and trust me, that's like way up here. And so she really didn't want me to go work for him, and so she filed for divorce, I got fired, we eventually, thank God, patched our relationship up. And then I had to return back to Skybridge. Uh, the administration blocked the sale of Skybridge. This was right before the tension started with the Chinese. And so I met a group of uh, Chinese private equity people uh, from Steve Schwartzman. And so taking you back now to 2016, 17, Blackstone sold their stake in Hilton Hotels to the H&A group in China. And if you remember, you know, Steve has a scholarship in Beijing uh, called the Schwartzman Scholars. And we had generally, I would say, a decent relationship economically with the Chinese. And that whole apple cart obviously got flipped over between the combination of President Xi, Donald Trump, the interaction between our two economies, et cetera. And so the administration blocked the sale, which I was happy about because I got the return to my my firm, but I just, why am I bringing all this up? So those were really bad situation for me. But when you're taking risk and you're trying new things in your life, that's what happens. Sometimes they go beautifully. You know, and I were talking about years ago, you know, I was in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis and Mike Corbett, who was not yet the CEO of Citibank called me. He had gone to uh, business school when I was at Harvard Law School, and he was trying to sell a non-core asset because they were in trouble with the FDIC and they were getting money from TARP. This is 15 years ago. That created an opportunity for us. And so I had to take the risk. I, had a, I took out a mortgage on my house. I took all the proceeds from the first sale of my first company, and I bought that business from Citibank, and I merged it into Skybridge. Contemporaneous to that, there was uh, an evacuation of conferences in Las Vegas. And so my team came to me and said, listen, we should do a conference. Uh, at that point, we were, uh, didn't know if it was going to be a success or not a success, frankly. Uh, but we ended up doing the conference for 14 years in Las Vegas. Uh, unfortunately, it got curtailed by COVID. We had a stopped the event in 2020, and then we restarted the event, but we had to wait till September, and we put it here in New York at the Javits Center. But my point is, is that all of these things are risks 
you're sitting there right now in your life, you're taking risk, calculated risk, you're making a decision to go into business with somebody, start a business, grow your business, and you're, you've got to take these calculated risks. And so what ends up happening sometimes is you take that risk and you get killed. Before you ask another question, can I talk about Sam for a second or no? Yeah, be before we go to Sam, I mean, we, you spent, I don't know, tw 12 days at the White House. Um, 11. 11, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, very I mean, I'm being very say, generous. Some okay. people say 10 and it hurts my feelings, but I don't want you to say 11 because that's like fake okay. news. Okay. At least it's not nine and a half weeks, right? Yeah. Um, famous movie. Um, tell us how is how, white, how, how politicians behave compared to... Uh, corporations, corporate people. Uh, what, what is so, the difference? I mean, I know they all go out and ask for money. Uh, they're right. very good in that, okay? Capital raising, etc. cetera. But in, in what's your experience? How would you characterize these people? So President Trump said something to me that I'll never forget. I'll share it with you. I was in the Oval Office with him, and this was on a Wednesday. The reason I know that is I was only there for one Wednesday, so that's how I know it was a Wednesday. And we were sitting and I'll, I'll just frame it for you. I was sitting in the chair to his right, and he was at the Resolute desk, and he was leaning back in the chair. He looks at me, and he says, you know, I got to tell you, he goes, I, I thought I was a killer. I worked in the uh, real estate area of New York with some of the biggest, toughest, meanest real estate developers in the world, and I thought these people were killers until I got to Washington. And when I got to, these are a bunch of babies compared to the people here in Washington. He says, you know, there's an assistant down the hall, she'll stab your eyeball out with a ice pick and she'll drop it in her martini glass and she'll still talk to you while you're bleeding and she's still talking to you. And his point was that Washington is way more ruthless and way more aggressive. And I wanna try to frame this for you because this, these are business leaders here. Here in this room, we're all, on the green team. And what do I mean by that? Green meaning money. So we may not like or trust each other in a situation, but let's say we're gonna make a lot of money together and you dislike me, but there's a billion dollars on the table. And if you can fake liking me for six months, we can each split the billion dollars. We'll get a half a billion dollars each. You're gonna fake like me. In Washington, there's no green team. It's about position and power location of your office, where are you sitting on Air Force One, is your office in the West Wing or is it in the executive office building, where's your office in the Senate office buildings, et cetera. And they drive themselves crazy over this stuff. The other thing they do is they drop dimes on each other all day. So we could be at a meeting together having a cordial time together and you mentioned to me something about your personal life. I actually hate, secretly hate your guts. They'll pick up the phone and call the reporter and they'll out something that's very private about you to the reporter without even blinking, no problem. Anonymous source says X, Y, Z, which is terrible about you. And so this goes on and it's expected. You know, and Harry Truman once said, if you, you, know, you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. But even the dogs are biting each other in Washington now. I mean, it's gotten out of control. And I really think it has, a lack, has to do with a lack of community and civic service. And so I'll be brief, but I just want to tell you this quick story. Bob, Bob Dole, who was a senator from Kansas, Republican, had a very good relationship with George McGovern. I think he was a senator from North or South Dakota. I don't remember where, but he was a... Democrat, and so when they interviewed Dole, he said, well, how do you guys get along? You disagree on every policy matter. He said, well, you know, we, we fought in the Second World War together. And so we bonded in the Second World War. And if you, I don't have charts with me, but if I took you through the Congress and the years of military service in the Congress and the percentage of people that had served in the military or did something related to the civic virtue or the service of the United States, it was at 75, 80% in the 1960s, it's at 10 or 11% today. So that connectivity has gone and we've become very tribal. And then the second thing we did was 
the gerrymandering is out of control now. So um, I just submit this to you rhetorically. Are we in a real democracy if the politicians are picking the voters? I thought the voters were supposed to pick the politicians, but they don't anymore. Politicians are looking through the cookies on your laptop and your hardtop computer, your phone, and they're looking at your geolocation of your house, and they're trying to figure out if you're a Democrat or a Republican, and then they come in with a scalpel and they'll move you out of the district if they perceive you as a potential adversarial vote. And if you look at these congressional districts from 1972, they look like geometric shapes that we would all recognize from geometry in ninth grade. But today, they're all jagged zigsaw puzzles and it's both sides, they're both doing it to each other. And this has allowed for people to stay in power for multiple decades. I mean, it's become a, I mean, Nikki Haley said this and I believe, it's become a nursing home. You know, Chuck Grassley is 91 years old. I guess he's like, he's been there for 60 plus years. The Senator from Iowa, he wants to run for reelection. You know, I mean, Mitch McConnell, unfortunately he's having public moments which are health related and I you know, respect him and respect his service, but he's 81 years old. Uh, we've seen the president fall five or six times. Donald Trump, you may like him in this room or dislike him, he's 78. I mean, we're going, but, I mean. But he's much more vital, he's, he has he's energy. He's much more vital, but come on, we're gonna be choosing between dementia and demented. I mean, that's gonna be the, I mean, honestly. No much, they yeah. Get it, right? you, got yeah. A, you got a choice between dementia and demented, and the demented guy's soon to have dementia because he's coming in on it. And so, I mean, come on guys, this is a great country. Every person in here has experienced a portion of the American dream, if not the full banquet of the American dream. And we should be expecting more from these people and we should be holding people more accountable than we are. Moving to another uh, big story was SBF who was convicted. Uh, we don't know how many years he was going to get, 34 years, he's a three-year-old guy. Um, I s saw you about uh, 13, 14 months ago also at Mike Novogratz's boat, you remember when you invited me? Mm -hmm. Did you have any sense when we spoke? Because you told me, Vidak, I sold my company I gave up 30%. So, so the Remember that? You, to, you, you told me that. So uh, yeah. did you have any sense in that week, that month, that something, did so, you have any feeling uh, that something is kind of well, not quite well? I, I think this is interesting, and so I'll, I'll share it with you. So Mike has been public about it. So Mike lost money in that deal. Mike was a investor. Remember, Sam gave me the money. But guys like Mike participated in those rounds and they lost money as a result of being equity investors. There were 25 well-known venture capitalists and sovereign wealth funds and individual investors. Larry Fink has admitted and gone public, so I'll share it. His name is, well, he lost $25 million investing in FTX. And so when you step back and look at the people that were defrauded by Sam. It is an incredible list of people and it's also very humbling because when the Theranos situation went down with Elizabeth Holmes and the media was very quick to put the list out of people that made these investments and you looked at the list, you're like, okay, some exceptionally smart people, how did they get it so wrong? And then when it happened to me, I actually now know how they got it so wrong. So. Let me tell you three or four things, and maybe you can learn from my experience. And I will say this, people do not like talking about this. If I bring up people's names, they go crazy. I mentioned one hedge fund manager at an event, he called me seven times. How could you mention my name, blah, blah, blah. But I'm out here talking about it publicly because if I can spare one person, just one person, from going through what we went through at the firm, or me personally, I have absolutely no problem talking about it. So. Here are three observations. So number one, to commit a financial crime of that magnitude, it has to be a very tight-knit circle. Uh, you can't 
commit a financial crime of that magnitude if you have outside vendors, a well-known accounting firm, well-known legal team, uh, compliance vendor that's been outsourced because if you have 50 people in the room that are controlling the money, there'll always be at least one person of conscience that will raise their hand and say, geez, I'm sorry, that's not gonna work for me. But what Sam did is something that Bernie Madoff did. He tightened the circle, he had three or four people that were running the money and one of them was the head of technology that manufactured the stuff that we saw in the green, the data room, that we saw in his uh, financials that he presented to the venture capitalists. So he literally had a back door. The other thing he was doing, um, and it didn't actually come out in the trial, but I learned this actually from the post inquiry of the aftermath of this, they had accounts set up. So let's say you had your money at FTX. So your money was in your account at 12 midnight. At 12 midnight in one second, it was swept into Alameda's account. At 11.59 and 59 seconds, it showed back up in your account, and then one second later, it got swept into Alameda's account. So when you were taking a snapshot or you were looking at your app to see your money, they weren't updating it real time. It was as of midnight of the night before. And so this was a very sophisticated fraud, but lesson number one, you have to close in on the four or five people that you think are operating, and then you have to find out who is checking those four or five people. And that is a very big lesson in this. And then when you go back to Madoff 10 years ago, that's exactly what Madoff did. Tell me how you handle um, enormous stress um, when media attacks you. Like, yeah. I don't want to mention the name of the media here, but... No, you can mention me. I've been bombed by Bloomberg. I was, uh, had me sinking in a Bitcoin boat on the front page of the New York Post business section. I mean, I've had every possible thing you can have happen to you happen. And when you're a public figure and you have to face the music, you can't be a public figure and go on television and make a mistake like that and then pretend it didn't happen. You know, you have to face the music and I think it's very important. I also, you know, I have five children and I have to explain to my kids that it's okay to have failure in your life. I have very wealthy friends of mine that are so hard on their kids and they're so like, I did everything right and my life's gone perfect and they, they try to paint this picture of themselves that is just totally unrealistic. It's almost the way the kids filter each other now on social media. You know, I'm, I'm watching these kids look at each other and they've got the phone out and they're looking at somebody's filtered life and then they're reflecting back on their unfiltered life and they're upset about it. And if you don't believe me, just look at the different psychological studies that are out there. But we do that, right? We try to filter and pretend that things are going well when they're not and we try to code over things and stuff like that. I prefer not to do that. I feel if I'm doing that, that I'm not creating the space for my children. I gotta allow my children to see the ups and downs, you know? Um, but the one thing I will tell you is that, and I said this to the prosecutors, and I, I spent uh, four and a half hours in the Department of Justice at the Southern District talking to them. They invited me in voluntarily, I turned over all my emails, I turned over my WhatsApp, my text messages, the whole thing. Spent four and a half hours with them. And I said, you know, the one thing is super important to me, and I know it's gotta be important to you, and you have to think about this. My dad was a crane operator. And he grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania in a coal mining town. And if you looked up the house that my dad grew up in on Zillow today, the Zestimate is $34,000. I'm talking about 2023. It's a cinder block house. It's literally one floor. There were three rooms in the house. They had one bathroom. And at the age of 11, they had no hot water in the house. They had to heat the water and bring it into the house. I didn't grow up like that, by the way. I grew up decidedly in the middle class because of the hard work of my father. I would never dishonor him and tell you I grew up poor. I did not grow up poor. I lived in a really nice 
middle class community. My dad was a crane operator for 42 years. He got a nice hourly wage, but that's how he grew up. It wasn't until his older brother came back from the war with GI money, they bought a hot water heater in the house. Why am I bringing this up? Because I would never dishonor my father by taking somebody's money. If I gotta go broke tomorrow and that's gotta happen to me because of fate or risk taking or whatever can happen in life, I'm not dishonoring my dad. After watching him work like that for all of that time, and if you think you're going crazy on your job, I just want you to imagine getting in and out of a crane on Long Island, hot and cold weather, every two hours you gotta grease the crane's hopper and all the cables to make sure you don't create a uh, workplace accident. In hot and cold weather, five, sometimes six days a week, eight to 12 hours a day. And I remember when I got my job at Goldman, my dad, I mean, this is also a true story, my mother, was embarrassed for me that I had gone to law school and did not become a lawyer. So my mother was telling all the Italian women in the area that Goldman and Sachs was a law firm. Okay, so I was in like Rosano's Italian deli on a Saturday morning and like Mrs. Fagawa comes over to me and says, you're practicing law? I said, what do you mean, Ms. Fagawa? At Goldman and Sachs, your mother says it's a very prestigious law firm. I said, yes, Mrs. Fagawa. My mother was embarrassed for me. I was wearing, she had, because she didn't have any clue, right? But when I took that job at Goldman, my father said something to me I will never forget. He said, I don't want you ever complaining about that job. And I say, why, why is that, Pop? He said, you know, you're gonna be indoors, you're out of direct sunlight, and there's no heavy lifting. And I want you to think about how lucky we are to have jobs like that, even during the financial crisis when we were getting hammered or last year, which was probably my worst year in the industry, I can remember what my dad said to me, I'm indoors, I'm out of direct sunlight, and there's no heavy lifting. And so you have to put these things in perspective, and you have to remember, if you think life is unfair, just by the virtue of the fact that we're all sitting here, we won the lottery. Go take a circle around the globe or look at some of these cities. You know, one of the things I did with Mr. Trump when we were on the campaign in 2016 is we visited, I did, because I, I kept a diary, I did 71 campaign stops. And I'm embarrassed to admit this to you, but I'm gonna share this with you. I couldn't believe what was going on in the country. We took a group of people that I grew up with, and I would define those people as aspirational working class people. And through policies and globalization and indifference, political indifference, we took 20 to 30% of the country and we turned them from working class aspirational to working class economically desperational in 35 years. I remember coming out of New Mexico and I was getting back on then candidate Trump's plane and he looked at me and said, you look down, why are you down? I said, well, meeting these people. I went across the security perimeter and I said, you know, Mr. Trump, I, I talked to a guy and he said to me, you know, you think you're in New Mexico, but new New Mexico, that would be Mexico. That's where, the, that's where my job went. They shut the factory down here in Albuquerque and they moved it to Mexico. And so I lost my job and I'm now delivering Domino's pizza at night. And I'm working at Lowe's, the home improvement store during the day. And I looked at him and it dawned on me, I was talking to my dad, but it just happened to be someone born in the 1960s or 70s, not the 1930s like my father. And so these middle class manufacturing, these middle class work with your hands or technical skill, non white collar, blue collar jobs have been decimated around the country. And these people are very upset and it has not gotten better. It's gotten worse since 2016. And they don't like us on Wall Street. They don't like the media. They don't like the medical establishment. They don't want to take the vaccine. They don't like the deal. They feel that the deal is unfair now. And we're not doing anything to help them. Honest to God, we're not. And I'm not, I'm just being observational and being honest. And I 
will tell you this, that, and I had to be honest with myself, I miss this. And you can like Trump or you can dislike Trump, but he saw it, I missed it, and I should have seen it because I grew up with these people, but here's what happened to me. I went to Tufts, and then I went to Harvard Law School, then I went to work at Goldman, and I went to a hedge fund, then I started going to Davos, Switzerland, and going to different conferences, and I started getting insulated by the group think of the people I was hanging out with, and I actually missed what was actually happening in a good one-third of the country. And so I'm sharing this with you because this is the dilemma that we have. If we don't fix this, it's going to continue to get worse, and then you and your family are going to be in a Bob wired you know, security compound in your McMansion while your fellow neighbors are suffering. And we have to fix it. You can't be indifferent to this because you can just study this and know it doesn't go well. Sure, you'll make it through your lifetime, but your grandchildren are going to be faced with this. And we have to fix it. And there's ways to fix it, but our political leadership is not focused on it. You know, they're indifferent to it. And so until they get focused on it, and you have to get them focused on it because you have the money. You know, and, and if you're not invested in the political system, I just want you to think about it as a business person. If you live in New York and you're paying the highest tax rate, you're paying 52%, roughly. That makes you a minority partner in your own life. Okay, just stop and think about it. A dollar comes in, 52 cents is going to Eric Adams, Kathy Hochul, and Joe Biden, and 48 cents is going to you and your family. So you're now a minority partner in your own life. You shouldn't be involved in the hiring decisions of your majority partner. You just gotta, you, you know, because what happens is they've designed the system to make you indifferent. And the more indifferent you are, the better it is for them because then they can plunder and do the things that they're doing. But I just want you to think about this. There's 144 million people that vote the exact same way in every single election. And there'll be about 180 million of them tomorrow because on an off cycle year, there's more of them. And who are those people? They're the non-voter, ladies and gentlemen. The non-voter is 50% of the vote. And they vote the exact same way in every election by not voting. So you wanna make the politicians nervous, engage the non-voter and bring the non-voter into the swimming pool because then they would have to flatten out their ideas and make their ideas more moderate and more mainstream. So these are the things that I've learned while getting my teeth kicked in, in Washington or experiencing these people. The Sam thing, I have gone over three or four times in my mind, and I'm not proud of this either, but I would probably still make that mistake. I'm not going to be out of the risk-taking business I'm not going to be out of the capital formation and new business business. I mean, we're going to keep a more cynical eye towards people and fraud, and we've been burned, of course, but I don't want to withdraw from the risk-taking because the risk-taking is what's gotten me here, wherever I happen to be. But that's, there's no way I could get from where I grew up to where I am right now without throwing the football. Mm -hmm. And when you throw the football, you get intercepted. There is a saying, uh, truth, truth sets you free. What's truth for you and how you, can, what, what can you share to the audience regarding your outcoming book that is coming in April, I, I believe. What, what, what are so some I, of the lessons I, so I, that you can share with us? Because obviously the book is not published, so we don't know what it is inside. Yeah, so I, I, have a, I have a book coming out in April and I just decided that, you know what, I'm gonna just write it all down. So I start the book, I think, with the story I just told you. I've been fired, lit up like a Roman candle, and now I'm trying to rebuild my marriage and all the trust that was lost there, and I'm trying to go back to my company and rebuild the company. Uh, then we get hit with COVID. Our company doesn't do well in the beginning of COVID, and it does well, and then we meet Sam. And I wrote the whole thing down, because I keep a diary, and I take people through in the book 
the meetings that I had with Sam in the Middle East. So I just want you to imagine I've got 25, 30 year relationship with the president of uh, the UAE. I bring Sam to meet him. Of course, Sam wants to go in his gym shorts. I actually went to Bloom. My, my, my sister's a personal shopper at Bloomy. She's not there anymore. She went to go work for one of her biggest customers, but she, she bought Sam the suit. If you've seen Sam in one of these perp walks, one of those ties is mine, okay? It's a $450 tie. I want to kill the kid, okay? I gave it to him in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, I mean he can keep the tie. But the, the, the point I'm making is that, like, I want you to think about this, okay? I was taking him to meet my most important clients and my most important global relationships. I brought him to the presidential palace to meet MBS in Riyadh. And by the way, and if you had Mike Novogratz up here or you had people that made investments with him, he was a likable guy. We can revise history right now, but going back 18 months ago, he was on the cover of Forbes and Fortune magazine, and he was at every conference. The day he got arrested, uh, or excuse me, let me rephrase that. The day he filed for bankruptcy was November 11th. What's today's date, November 7th? November 6th. November 6th. Okay, so he got, he filed for bankruptcy on November 11th. You know where he was supposed to be that morning? He was flying to New York to speak at the Goldman Sachs Analyst Conference. Okay, so he was very respected and he was everywhere. Now he was odd, and obviously we learned later that he was manufacturing some of that oddity. Um, but I wrote a book about all this from the White House through that situation and where we are right now. And again, I did that because I think if somebody could pick up that book and learn from that, and it helps them with their business or their career, uh, uh, then it's worth it. I'd rather do that than, you know, I mean, you get these crisis communications, people, they're great, right? They come in, they say, don't do anything. Uh, yeah, well, you got, you got fired from the White House? Yes, I did. Don't do anything. Uh, we'll see you, you got fired in 2017, okay. You can reemerge in 2020. Don't do anything that don't do. I went on Stephen Colbert like the next week. Face the problems. You know, Colbert said to me, you think you're gonna last a long time in the White House? I was like, longer than a carton of milk in the refrigerator. I think I was gonna get blown out before the milk spoiled. But you own it and you move forward. And if you do that, there's always a tremendous amount of opportunity. You know, the president of the UAE, he sat with me and Sam in the presidential palace for an hour and 20 minutes. When the fraud was exposed, I was embarrassed to call him. I'm not proud of that. I should have picked up the phone and called him and said, Mr. President, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I brought him to see you in the presidential palace. So, I visited Sam on Tuesday the 8th. The president called me on November the 10th, a day before the bankruptcy. When my assistant said NBC called me, I was gulping. I was like, oh my God, he's gonna probably be light, light, light me up. I called him back and he called me to ask me how I was. Are you okay? We've been friends for a long time. This is a terrible situation. How can I help you? See that? That's the type of person you want to be for your friends, right? But I was embarrassed to call him. I was afraid to call him because I felt the shamefulness of bringing Sam to visit him. But he called me to say, hey, are you okay? We're definitely gonna do some business together. Sit tight, be cool. You'll get yourself through this. And I'm telling you that story for a reason because you want to be that person for somebody in your life who's fallen or made a mistake or tripped up somewhere. You want to be the person, hey, are you okay? But you also want to be a good person so that when you fall, I mean, you know, you see some of these politicians fall. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if you guys even remember Elliot Spitzer, but when he fell, nobody caught him because he was a mean-spirited guy and so nobody caught him. You want to be the person, man or woman, that when you fall, your friends want to be there for you. You know, so I, I told my kids, look, you have integrity, you'll always have opportunity. There'll always be people that want to do business with you.
Thanks so much. Anthony. Hey, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for having me. Let's, I appreciate it. We'll finish with integrity and truth. Right? Well, that's it. You Thank you so much for being straight. so open and sharing all those insights with Thank us. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the time. Thank you.